Wow, I'm surprised you're not wearing your slippers today. Oh, my clocks. No, those were slippers. I actually thought about wearing them today. I thought about wearing mine too. My Uggs. See, those are slippers. Welcome to Big Things. I'm Mitzi and this is Mike. And this is our show where we talk about the big things that we're seeing in marketing, social media, pop culture, and sports. We'll also talk through signals that we're watching that could inform the future of digital marketing. You can catch this show every week on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. My preference is YouTube because, of course, we got these lights and these cameras and these mics. But um, you do you, boo. Totally. And if you're a listener of Waves or Tea for Lunch, you're going to love this show because it's a lot of the same stuff, but just more of us, which is, I'm sure, why you're here. But you can expect less interviews, more news and pop culture and signals and trends. Yeah, I feel like the trends are nice. Yeah. It's like a, w- a way to help you kind of zoom out from being reactive to all these micro trends that are happening and be more proactive mm-hmm. in the big picture, which is something we all want. Totally. Also, if you're new here, that means our social clips are working. So hi, I'm Mitzi. This is Mike. We're married. We're also co-founders of an agency called Arcade. And we've been working in digital marketing for over 15 years. Which Have we actually? 15 really years? Old. Well, I'm that's just fact-checking you live. <laughs> You're like, you agreed not to fact-check me. Um, um, okay, I, we'll roll with it. 15 years. Wait, should we fact-check it? So what What year is it? Oh, almost 15 it's years. The year so this 2024 is correct. 2024 of our Lord. Because I got my first job in 2010. So almost 15 years. Yeah, so there you go. There Thanks. you go. Thanks for Pretty close. fact-checking close enough. me. Anyways, but we're going to talk about a few things today, a few big things including Beyonce's recent collaboration with Levi's. More about Meta's glasses, their AR glasses. Right, and the F1 partnership with LVMH. It's going to be good. Mm -hmm. These are some good topics. So buckle up. But before we get into all that, I had an amazing night last night. I went to a fabulous event that was put on by Sunday's Furniture. Shout out to Barbara and Oscar and the whole team there. They kindly hosted me for this creative craft night. And it was so fun. The showroom, which we've been to, is it's so beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's stunning. It's one of those showrooms that like kind of feels like an art gallery. Like you walk around, it's kind of immersive. Everything's like beautifully designed. But for last night, they like reimagined the space and it really felt like a home. They had like a crafty kind of night. So they had like all these like um, cloths over some of their platforms and they had like an art area, like a painting area. And they had like a sculpture area with this really great ceramicist who's Mm. from Calgary. And she was like teaching us all how to make these like little ring dishes. They had like an illustration space with like an illustrator and they had this like a massive charcuterie board and beautiful flowers. It was just like such a nice night. And I had so much fun. Seeing like old friends, new the se- friends. The setting makes me, for some reason, it's making me think of Bridgerton. No, it was nothing like, like you know that. the one brother who's like the artist? I'm not a big Bridgerton <laughs> fan, so I'm probably like going to just mess this up. But from one of the few episodes I saw, I feel like the one brother who like isn't really trying to get married and he's kind of like an artist type and he's often at parties and a lot of them are like art parties. At least from what I oh, saw. Oh, and they're like painting at the party. Yeah, they're doing like portraits of like, each other and there's like, like make out. sheets everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Stuff like that happens. It wasn't like that. <laughs> no one made out? No. Oh, okay. Um, it was really wholesome and sweet. And Sounds like, kind of regal though. Like that kind of vibe? No? No. <laughs> was the furniture still there? The furniture was there. Okay. But it just felt like like a like a living room party. Like mm. it was just really sweet and wholesome. And it was such a great night. And everything was going great. And I did the ceramicist, like the ceramic part. I did like mingling. I had some snacks. And then we got to the painting part of the evening. And me and Mel, who came with me, we sat down to do a painting. And this artist, her name's Tannis, she's very talented. And she was going to teach us all how to make this like oil-based watercolor painting. And like her work is beautiful. Like it's so stunning. But it's one of those like, you know, when you go in an art gallery and you're like, hmm, I feel like I could do that. It's kind of like similar vibes. Not that her work is like that, but it was like similar kind of like, it doesn't look super complicated to like the untrained eye. Yeah. It was like, you know, you don't really see everything that goes into it. So that's kind of like how I went into this. So we got a canvas, we got like our palette, like our paints, our brushes, different like sponges. And then she did this like walkthrough and she's like, this is your mood board. So she had these like 
like printouts of like different like ocean scenes and like caves and like all these beautiful like photography. And she's like, this is the mood board that inspired this piece. And this is the mood board that inspired this piece. She's like, now here's your mood board and here's your colors. And then it was like, go crazy. And I like was really struggling because I don't I'm not like a free form person that can just like use their hands to make something like I need structures I need paint by numbers I need someone to show me like this is right this is wrong now take your brush and do this so I was literally like paralyzed I felt like I was having an existential crisis because I was like what do I do now and she's like just do whatever whatever you're inspired to do and I'm like what does that Pardon mean me. yeah, yeah like I literally could not compute like I couldn't understand pick up like I was like okay I pick up my paintbrush put in the paint and then what like blank canvas is like really intimidating yeah so I did my best and I went through many like I feel like it was like art therapy for me because I started one way and then I completely painted the whole board (laughs) and started another way then I see people like pouring water and people using these like like um like boards to like move the water on the canvas it was like crazy so I tried a little bit of everything and then ended up with like a nice brown piece with a few swatches and I actually left my painting there because I was so discouraged by it but anyways I went through like quite the emotional roller coaster in 40 minutes on my own so it was quite the night wow considering the roller coaster you came home pretty cheerful yeah it was a great event I still had like such a great time I just walked away with so much respect for artists who don't get like a playbook you know Drew are you listening all the artists. And then on top of that, people judging them like me. Right. Where it's like, oh, that doesn't look that hard. Like, yeah, right. Like, I could never, ever. It's so vulnerable to put out art in the world. But then also, like, like, it just takes so much restraint and creativity. And, like, I walked away with a whole newfound respect for artists and creative work and all that. It's, like, yeah. so cool creativity and imagination but also like discipline in a way to not like try to do too much right like when do you know when to stop I know it's also like kind of like communication like it's easy to try and fit in too many ideas and like if you're speaking at an event or like yeah I don't know I don't need to force that analogy but I feel like you and me at our company we have the luxury of getting to have ideas but not necessarily be responsible for like using our hands to bring them to life right right? because we have a great team so yeah I could see I think I would be crippled in the same way where it's one thing to visualize something in my mind like I can maybe picture what I'd want the canvas to look like but how do I get there I don't Mm -hmm. know no it was so it was so crazy cool well it sounds like a fun event yeah you showed me a picture of the charcuterie and that looked wild I know the charcuterie it was beautiful and I was actually, I was totally planning to like do something and then bring it home and then like prank you and tell you that I like, it was like worth $6,000, but I got it at an auction for like 2000 and be like really excited and see what, how you'd react. But I was just like, I didn't bring it home. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't sell it probably. No. But yeah, that was my evening. Amazing. Charcuterie reminds me of that show we've been watching Nobody wants this when the mom eats the mm. eats the charcuterie in the kitchen. Yeah, that show is like the talk of social media right now. Everyone's watching it, which is really exciting because it's been a while since we've all like collectively as a society watched a show together. So we binged it. When was the last time like Game of Thrones? I mean, it depends on who you ask. There's a niche audience for everything. You could say like everyone's watching The Bear for a little bit. Yeah, that felt less communal though. Mm hmm. Because even us, like, we watched the first few episodes of season one of The Bear and then kind of abandoned it and then, like, months later returned to it and then got right. hooked, you know? But, yeah, to your point, I feel like it has been a community experience. And one thing I feel like we've been lacking beyond just watching a TV show in community with people on the internet is a good rom-com. Yeah. Like, we've been craving a good rom-com. Mm-hmm. We, we, and we've thought about it in more of, like, a movie context. But even what we talked about last week, it's hard to kind of stick with movies right now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like when we went to watch this, we actually thought it was a movie. And then mm-hmm. we we opened it up and it was episode one. We were like, yes, it's a show. I was so thrilled that it was yeah. a show. I'm like, yeah, that's my format. 
but it's great for millennials because um, it just brought us back to the OC days. I know. I love Seth Cohen. I love and Sandy Kristen Bell's Cohen. fun too. She's got some good OG movies and like comedies that we've all enjoyed. Yeah. So you watched the OC when you, it was live. I didn't watch all of it, but I definitely watched enough to like know what was happening and be part of like the cultural moment mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's a good show. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you check it out. I'm also watching The Golden Bachelorette, and I think I'm, like, alone in this. This is a show that's, like, the complete opposite of Nobody Wants This because I'm the only one watching it. Well, me and Alyssa on our team are the only ones watching it, but it's so good. I feel like a lot of people aren't watching it because it is, like, too emotional. Right. It's, like, I mean, there's, it's funny because it's, like, it's so emotional. Like, people can't bear to watch it, but then there's shows, like, Breaking Bad and like Game of Thrones that are so intense and like to me that feels like something I wouldn't watch. Yeah, but those are more of like a they take you out of your reality kind of intense. Whereas even like, Breaking Bad, I think so. Mm. Although to your point, like we never got through Breaking Bad because it was too stressful. Yeah, maybe less that one. Maybe they're separate. Game of Thrones is because it's like fantasy. It just feels completely disconnected from reality. Mm-hmm. So it's almost therapeutic in that way where Breaking Bad just makes you feel like someone's, if you look out your window, someone's going to be like parked at your curb, like watching yeah. you with binoculars or something. Like I guess that. my point is I like, just wonder what it says about us as a, as a society where we have more of an appetite for like violence and like, like, um, gore, over something so wholesome like right. widows falling in love. Yeah, it's someone talking about their their husband that passed away and how I much know. they miss them. <laughs> like we like people are like I can't I can't go there. Yeah, it's <laughs> but, too like, much. Children being beheaded like we'll get through it. You know? Whoa. Well, that's what the show. That's what um what was it House of Dragon? I guess yeah. There's some hectic stuff in those shows yeah. for sure. Anyways. Do you want to get into thing one? Let's do it. Uh, Thing one, this is a big thing of the week for me especially as a proud member of the Beehive. Beyonce released a collaboration with Levi's and it's fine. It's fine. I never thought I'd see the day that you speaking about something Beyonce related would just say it's fine. I know. Like, I know. I, when it comes to Beyonce, like I live my life with like, like arms wide open and wallets wide open for anything that she has to offer me. I hear that. But unfortunately, this just wasn't quite what I wanted, what I needed. But I'm going to hold hope because this is one of many. There's apparently more to come. Yes, chapters in this collaboration. Beyonce just loves to do chapters. She's all about like, this is the end of one chapter. This is the start of the next chapter. Kind of like her Renaissance album. Maybe there's something psychologically there in the same way that like we don't really like movies, but we like TV shows. It's like so chapters, you're saying I'm kind of like, like Beyonce? I think no, like maybe her. there's something happening just like in the culture that's like we need everything to be episodic. Right, maybe. Although I feel like I'm the only one who's like <laughs> who thinks that way. You think so? Maybe. I mean, I feel like TV used to be like the, the inferior version of or the inferior side of Hollywood compared to the movie side of mm-hmm. Hollywood. And now it's it's flipped. So I think right. it's not just you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, anyways, back to Beyonce. She teased the collaboration with Levi's like for the last few weeks or I guess week or so. And it was actually turned out to be a, a collaboration, which is a reaction to Beyonce's latest album, uh, which included a song track called Levi's Jeans. The track spelled Levi's L E V I I jeans, while Levi's, the company, is L E V I. So there's a little bit of a difference there. So apparently, this track was actually a surprise to the Levi's marketing team. And when the track list first went live, the CMO and the team is like scrambling to come up with something to make this moment matter for the for the company. Classic. Um, I know, which I was the so shocked by. The classic brand marketing team scramble. Like, I can't believe that they didn't know that Beyonce was working on a song about, with their, like, name in it. You would you would think that, but also, like, Beyonce isn't that thirsty to be, like, yeah. getting her team to give the Levi's a heads up just totally. so that she can get that brand partnership, you know? Yeah. 
So I was reading an article about this and they talked about with the like CMO of Levi's and I guess when they saw this happen, they knew they needed to react to it and make it a moment. And the big plan that they wanted to do is make or I guess convert more women to become shoppers of Levi's. So currently the company says that a third of their shoppers are women. They wanted to bump that up to 50 percent, which I thought was interesting because sometimes you see these collaborations and some people who maybe aren't in our industry would be like, oh, that was really cool that they did. But I think with all these collaborations, there's a goal in mind. And I, I think for this one specifically, it was to increase the number of women customers. Mm. So um, Levi's announced the campaign. It's called Reimagine with Two Eyes. And it's a campaign that's going to stretch into 2025 and it will unfold over four chapters. Also, Beyonce loves the number four. If you don't know, Beyonce... Her birthday is September 4th. Her husband's birthday is December 4th. Her mom's birthday is May 4th or something like that. She just loves the number four. And then Blue Ivy is like the Roman numeral four. And Jay-Z has the album 444. Right. They're both like obsessed with the number four. So it's kind of cool that there's four chapters to this collaboration. What are these fours there for? Nice. Um, But they're also going to lean heavily into the history of the company And really focus their shift into women. So the first iteration of this collaboration was commercial that, you know, shows Beyonce going to this laundromat. Laundromat? Is that how you say it? Yep. Where they wash clothes. Mm -hmm. And she's carrying a bucket of diamonds or like jewels. And she like takes off her Levi's jeans, puts them into the laundry machine and then pours the diamonds into the, the laundry machine. And she's wearing like a cowboy hat, of course, and. Just getting her laundry done, as one does. And you're telling me they didn't put the diamonds on the jeans? Right. So that's the thing that can kind of like feels a little meh to me is there's nothing special about the product. So usually when you see a celebrity collab with a brand, like they do some personalization to the product, but there was nothing. It was just like your basic Levi's jeans. And there's nothing wrong with Levi's jeans, but like I just wish they would have added something to it. No kidding. Yeah, I don't know. It's giving to me that Levi's didn't have the budget to take this all the way. Could have been anything. Maybe Beyonce just didn't want to. Yeah. Or maybe it was, it reminds me of that um, Michael Jordan movie recently with um, Ben Affleck where the whole fight between Jordan and Michael, or between Nike and Michael Jordan was around Jordan wanting a royalty, mm. like an indefinite royalty. And they had never done that for an athlete before. Right. I wonder if maybe there's something going on here with that where Beyonce's like, if you, if we're going to do a collab product, then I need a royalty. And Levi's mm. just wanted to pay her for her, her presence. It's an appearance on fee. Set, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. That could very well be it. Like a deeper partnership would cost more and they just didn't have the budget for it. I don't know. I just, and I also feel like Beyonce doesn't care that much. She's not that invested She's an artist. to do it. Right. Yeah. And that like, made me start going down this rabbit trail about her other brand. So right now she's really pushing her whiskey brand. It's called like, I forget, Sir something. Um, But it just makes me kind of sad because I, I mean, I'm a huge Beyonce fan and she has such an intense fan base, but for some reason her brands don't really become these huge global billion dollar brands like other celebrity brands are. So It just kind of made me start thinking about it. And I read like a few articles about it and some deep dives. And I guess the consensus, what I think, is that Beyonce is that kind of like uber celebrity that is a bit like she's hard to touch. You know, she kind of lives in a different orbit. She really doesn't live in our common person orbit. And she's not that relatable. And I just feel like when I compare it to a celebrity brand like Skims, for example, like, you know, Kim wears Skims, you know, it's so. She wears nothing but Skims. Right. And it's so like, it's such an extension of who she is. Same goes with like Road Beauty, which is another big beauty brand that's coming out with Hailey Bieber or is out and it's very popular, but you see her use it. Like she uses it in her daily life. She posts about it. Like, the things in her life feel like I 
know her lifestyle and I can kind of relate to some pieces of her lifestyle. It's not so out of touch for me. And she's wearing this lip gloss and I want to wear that lip gloss. Like that's kind of how like celebrity brands work. And same with like Rare Beauty by Selena Gomez. Like she is using that product. And all these companies are huge, huge brands. And I just feel like with Beyonce, when she's released brands like like Ivy Parker or like her recent brand, like um, Sacred, which is her hair product brand, it just feels like a little too produced and not as organic. And it's sad to see because like, I want Beyonce's brands to do well. Like I want her hair care line to be as big as Fenty Beauty. But for some reason, because Beyonce is like so intentionally private and doesn't keep us into her daily life, she doesn't really get the same kind of like, she doesn't give us the same access that we need in order to buy into her brand. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree. It kind of has this like launch and walk away kind of attitude to it where I'm even just, as you're talking, I'm trying to think of other artists and celebrities with brands and everyone I can think of, like they really, their brand really embodies them. Mm Mm-hmm. Kanye West is a funny topic these days, but like Yeezy was like Kanye, you know, like he wore it all the time. It was his brainchild It all. He like pushed the envelope, um, and stood by his decisions Mm -hmm. and he was always talking about it Mm -hmm. and integrating it into shows and other types of experiences. Rihanna is a big one. That's like, she wins big with her brands. Um, And even in sports, like Michael Jordan is the obvious one, but other kinds of like namesake brands like Kobe and uh, even more recently Anthony Edwards and people like that. Yeah, I I agree. It just feels kind of like a line item on their like business plan for the year. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is like Beyonce doesn't need to do brands like she's successful with just her music Um, and she's so famous that like she's either going to have to sacrifice her privacy to make her brands bigger or just not expect much from them, you know? Right. Which reminds me like the only other celebrity that's like that big like her is Taylor Swift, who's also incredibly successful just through her music. She doesn't need a brand to like make her uber famous, you know, or put her into like a billionaire status. Like she's already doing that with just music, which is really hard to do. Yeah, for sure. She just put out a merch line. Taylor. As a bit of an, apparently a bit of a nod to Travis Kelsey. It's called Greatest in the League. And she put it out on National Boyfriend Day. That is so cute. I'm surprised you didn't know that. (laughs) I didn't know that. (laughs) Well, now you know. I love that. You might have to get some stuff. Is it like greatest? Like, what is it? That's all I know. I haven't like seen it, but. That is so cute. Yeah. I love that. I appreciated your little post on National Boyfriend Day too. You're welcome. I saw that um, the Kansas City Chiefs team was wearing like these Travis Kelsey shirts because he had like a bad media few days. Or, like, I actually week. saw something about that too and I didn't understand what his bad media was. Well, I think people were just like talking a lot about how like he didn't get any passes in a game and like everyone's like calling him to retire because he had like one bad game. Right. And so a slow start to the year. his team for practice or before the game were all wearing like Travis Kelsey fan shirts. Which I thought was really nice. That is nice. It's not a big Mahomes fan, but right. I'll get me past either. It. <laughs> I like Travis. Yeah, I do like Travis. I yeah. like Jason. I know Jason is too fun. Yeah, He's I how know. I want to be in like ten years. Yeah, they're so irreverent to like fan. Like they love their fans. They're so nice to their fans, but they're so irreverent to like pop culture and like the lore about them that it makes them. It makes me like them more. Like him and Kylie. I was just about to fact check if it was Kylie. Kylie was her name, but you're right. Yeah, yeah, I know. But that's that was that's what gave me pause. Yeah. But yeah, the Kelsey brothers are fun. Speaking of podcasters, they're mm-hmm. big podcasters. Speaking Maybe someday of the NFL, we'll get our big deal. I know. Speaking of the NFL, I saw a TikTok the other day that said that Carrie Underwood, like her song for Sunday Night Football. Gets her a million dollars a week. I mean, NFL, like football in general is just big business. So I know. So that's not shocking. So she makes about $18 million per season just for that song. 
just for one game a week. And she doesn't even need to perform it live. See, like, that's the difference between the day slate and primetime games because her jingle is for Sunday night football specifically. So right. prime t- those primetime spots do stand apart. I know you've explained primetime to me so many times. I still don't know which one's primetime. Sunday night. It's the evening games. Okay. On Thursday, Sunday, and Monday. Because there's oh, okay. only a, a single game usually. Sometimes there's a double header, but typically there's just a single game. So That's the time of day. Kind of like you were talking about last week, Matthew Perry and friends, and they were fighting for the primetime spot when they started. Mm-hmm. Same thing in football. That primetime spot is like the highest viewership and the most attention to just because there's not a bunch of other games going on. At right, the there's same not time. as many competing games. Yeah, so Carrie Underwood's jingle is specifically for the Sunday primetime game. Right. And I think she's been doing it now since 2005. Yeah, and it's crazy. It's just one night. It's not even like all prime time. It's not like Monday night song is her song and Sunday night song. And yeah, a million Thursday? dollars a week to be the jingle for one game. I know. That's so nice. It's legit. Um, I'm sure she doesn't take all of that home. Like she's got probably like her agents producers, and like producers yeah, yeah. and all the other people that take their cut. But, but Carrie Underwood, Underwood Inc., Mm-hmm. Carrie Underwood and Co. Yeah. Someone said Mitzi Raking and Co. is a reference to our, our team because they wanted us to do something for their whatever, like work. <laughs> and I just thought that was so cool. Should we rebrand? To Mitzi and Co. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's run it. <laughs> okay. Um, I also wanted to talk about Kim Kardashian because she wrote an open letter um, asking for the Menendez brothers to be freed. And apparently it worked. The L.A. prosecutors in that case are reviewing new evidence in the Menendez brothers case that could lead to a resentencing. Do you want to say who those people are? I don't remember their first names. But they're a topic right now because of the, the there's a new show about them. Yes, by Ryan Murphy. It's such a crazy. We attempted Are we going to keep it. watching it? No, I, I don't think I can. Like I had kind of Not like even to be part of the vibes. moment? Like I, I want to. I want to watch it. But. I don't know. Like I, that first episode was, wow. Yeah, watching them kill their. It was parents. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to know. Like I, I think I've seen a lot on TikTok, and the thing that I'm seeing on TikTok is that the way they're portrayed in the show is not really, like, accurate. Like some parts of the court scenes are very accurate, but then like they're, it's not accurate in other ways. Like this, like gruesome, like portrayal of them is not yeah. accurate. Got to make it interesting for the screen, you know. Totally, and Keep I know it kind of gets. Phones. I know it gets darker. Really? Yeah. Let's not. Yeah. We can just read about it. I know a lot about it, so I feel like I've gotten the gist. But um, I mean, it looks really good. Kim Kardashian has really taken her lawyer thing seriously. Yeah. Getting people out of jail. Yeah, I love to see it. Fair enough. Put some respect on the name. I was a doubter at first. Um, should we get into thing two? Let's do it. Someone put facial recognition tech into Meta's smart glasses to instantly dock strangers. Dox strangers. So we talked about Meta's AR, smart glasses, um, smart glasses. Man, I'm struggling right now. Because we didn't have tequila shots before I know. this. <laughs> You're putting us on blast. <laughs> <laughs> we started a little tradition where we have a little sip of tequila before each episode just to kind of loosen loosen up the gears. Mm-hmm. Today it's just coffee and water. So maybe we need to get back to the tradition next week, but we'll see. Um, Meta's smart glasses called Orion. Um, we talked about that last week with the story around Snapchat, but um, there's a little bit more development to the story this week as now there's the ability in these concept glasses to be able to, um, as you're looking at a person, pull in information from the internet about them, even their contact information and where they live and things like that. So like who their family members are. Yeah. And what they do for work and Mm -hmm. what their social handles are and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like we've all seen this before in like futuristic movies and stuff, but I think what it reminded me most of was black mirror. You remember season one? Like, I don't think, did we even watch past season one? Maybe a couple episodes and other seasons, but Season one, there was that classic episode where it was all about people kind of like raiding each other. It was futuristic Mm -hmm. and you'd put your phone up and stuff would pop up about the person and then you'd rate them based on the interaction you had with them. Yeah. Um, And it was so kind of alarming and off-putting, but I feel like we're still slowly moving in that direction in real life. 
especially with AI now. Mm -hmm. But it also reminded me, we were recently on Slack with our team sharing our Uber ratings with each other mm -hmm. and looking at, at that and comparing notes. And, and it was interesting even just to feel the feelings of getting poor ratings as drivers or as passengers on right. Uber. And you had the worst rating of the whole team. Did, was it the whole team? Yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone who was willing to share their ratings, you had the worst rating. It's because I shared too many rides with Drew. I think, yeah, I don't know what you did because <laughs> yours is the worst. You know what I think it actually is? I Because at first I was like, oh, it must have been during COVID when you're required to wear masks and I forgot to wear masks a couple of times. And they still accepted me as a passenger and didn't say anything about it. But, but then I got like like, reported later. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was honestly an accident, but I wondered if that was a, one of a few of the five one star ratings I have mm -hmm. out of hundreds. So it's not that bad, <laughs> but I, I actually think sometimes I use Uber Eats to order like groceries, like from Sentara or something like that. If we need milk for our kids or just like little miscellaneous items like that. And you always have to pick like a replacement item for the things that you order in case it's not in stock. Mm -hmm. And I usually do that. But then sometimes if they don't have that thing available or the replacement item, they'll try to contact you. Right. And I never notice when they contact <laughs> me. So I feel like some of these guys are just like chilling in Sunterra waiting for me to reply, <laughs> like trying to call me, but I'm on do not disturb and like putting our kids to bed or something That's like that. Definitely it. So that's got to be where the one stars came I'm from. I'm sure they're also silently judging you. Like this guy's like making me come to his house for like three, three boxes of oat milk. And well, you think I'm the only one like there's it's on there. There's got to be lots of people that do that. I don't know. Sometimes they're like Uber, like grocery deliveries are kind of like silly. I mean, they're getting paid and I always tip well. Yeah, true. Sometimes time is money. It's true. always time is money. Yeah. So that so was totally that was my like self this. exploration of why on earth did I have the worst rating, but also the worst rating was like four point eight two out of five. Like yeah. it, it was still a respectable rating. They must like rate the ones higher than the rest. Yeah, because you only had like what five one star ratings anyway. I think once you once you get up to a certain um, amount of reviews, then the old ones start to disappear off your record. I think it's a few hundred or 500 or something like that. And I feel like I'm getting close to whatever that number is. So hopefully some of my one stars will start mm -hmm. to fall off the back end of my <laughs> my reviews. Also, okay, so this story is about two Harvard students who did this. Like, don't aren't the Harvard students busy? Like, is this part of their, like, class project? Because I just feel like so many things, like, Harvard students are just, like, pulling off so many different, like, projects and stunts and, like, making such a big impact. Like, it wasn't Meta started by two Harvard students? Like yeah, I'm pretty sure. Mark Zuckerberg? I, I feel like schools like that, and it, they might not be like bachelor studies. It might They might be like masters or like Yeah, or this could be like a programs. thesis project or right, something. Right, where it's like you're actually doing real life cases mm -hmm. and coming up with solutions to real life problems. So <laughs> it's likely it's that like kind us. of like AI project, you know? Yeah. Meanwhile, we're just complaining that we're behind in our first syllabus class. Yeah. Like these, we these good students. Harvard students are actually doing like real work for the world. I'd like to think that if I went back and did a master's now at this point, I'd be a much better student. But. I'd like to think that too. But then I heard about Alyssa writing her thesis and it was like 42 pages and I was like, hard no. It's a big commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to get my rating up on Uber so that I don't get some like weird blacklist like in Black Mirror eventually. Um, but there is a new season of Black Mirror coming in 2025. There's some pretty cool cast on it, like Issa Rae and Aquafina. Aquafina, honestly, is probably like one of my low key, like underrated favorite actresses. Because she's in all the Disney movies that we watch. And she's just, her voice is so distinct and she's just really straight up funny. Yeah, she is funny. I'm actually really proud of her. I think about her often, so it's funny you're bringing her up. I wish I had a friend like her. I know, same. I think about her often because she's really figured out, like, how to monetize her assets. Like, she's in so many movies, like, animated movies. Her voice, and her voice is so distinguishable, and it's not, like, too much, like, I'm sick of this. I, I actually just want more. And I'm, like, I feel like an animated gig is such a nice gig because you don't have to, like, 
like it's not that it can't be that hard like little mermaid you mean yeah Yeah. like so i'm just like really proud of her yeah i'm proud of her too i feel like she was fun in in animated movies like little mermaid as as scuttle but what was that oh crazy rich asians she Mm -hmm. was like that's not animated that's like an she actually acted in that and she was hilarious in that yeah and she was also in another movie that we both really liked where the grandmother told everyone she was gonna die and then she didn't and it was like just her way of like getting her whole family together i do not remember that i feel bad that i don't know the title of it but i really liked that no you didn't we both liked it 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 felt it gave indie film vibes i can't remember Mm. the name of it but i feel like i'm like sort of picturing it i just can't really remember the plot but but yeah I like Alcofina. So, so are I, we going to watch the new Black Mirror? That's That was going to be my I question. No, I think if I were to watch it, I'd want to like read a synopsis and spoil it a little bit bef- like before I watch the episode because some, of, some of, of them are so like dark. Like some of them are still lingering in my mind. Like I can't believe it. Like the pig episode. Yeah, that was messed. That was crazy. Yeah, the writer Charlie Brooker said it's going to be a mix. Like they're apparently all sci-fi this time. All six, but there's going to be a mix of disturbing. Some will be funny and some will be emotional. Once you like emotional, you're watching the Golden Golden Bachelorette. Yeah, I'll watch emotional and funny. I'll probably skip the disturbing. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. But beggars can't be choosers and we don't have a show right now. Um, I have a show. Golden Bachelorette? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but you're, it's once a week, you know, like. Yeah, we need more than that. We watch more than once a week. For sure. We do have Shrinking season two coming out in mm-hmm. October, I think the sixteenth. So what was that, that look, um, look other sci-fi show that we liked with Rashida Jones in common? Silo. Silo. I think that's coming out soon. Yeah. Or is it next year? I don't know. We'll see. All right, so maybe we'll watch Black Mirror. <laughs> For thing three, <laughs> LVMH and F1 announced a decade-long partnership to begin in 2025. A statement from Formula One and LVMH described the deal as an unprecedented agreement between the world leader in luxury and the pinnacle of motorsport. What makes it unprecedented? Like, it's not like any of us didn't see this coming. Well, I think a lot of people might be surprised, but we didn't. We saw this coming because of Scan Club. Oh. We've been monitoring for a long time all these signals around sports and fashion. Right, but LVMH is like the luxury house of luxury houses, and Formula One is such an elite sport. Like, of course, this makes so much sense. It does make sense. I think it's going to be cool. But I think that quote is definitely like a media release kind of quote. It's like sensationalistic, for sure. So as part of the deal, LVMH, um, a few of their brands, including Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, and Teg Ewer, Um, will enjoy sponsorship opportunities across the sport. And other brands under the LVMH umbrella also include Sephora and Aimee Leon Dor, which are less talked about. But I'm curious, like, how many of the brands in the portfolio become a part of this deal? Is it just the big kind of classic Maisons, Mm -hmm. like Louis Vuitton, or is it the whole family, you know? Well, if I said Maisons. I said it like that because I don't really know how to say it. (laughs) So I was just trying to, like, sound like I knew how to to say it. Yeah. What do you think, though? Um, I feel like this is just an exclusivity thing. I think they're just, like, signing this deal to make sure, like, none of the other, like, non-LVMH properties try to get in into the F1 and F1 business. Do you think there's exclusivity in it? Because, like, F1's been doing stuff with Puma, and Puma hired ASAP Rocky to be the creative director specifically of their F1 partnership, and... There's just in general been other houses and brands that have been part of the F1 world. Yeah, I would assume so. Because I I feel like sometimes when these big global like sports events sign deals, they make like official partnerships. Like, for example, like the Olympics, like you can be an official Olympic partner and you're allowed to use certain terms like in your marketing, like Olympic whatever like before a product but if you're creating some sort of marketing campaign around the olympic event you can't use certain language because you're not a, a certified olympic partner so, so that's what i feel like is exclusivity happening. in the language that they'll be able to use around this and i'm sure like all the like events and 
outside situations and collabs, like I feel I would just, I would hope that there's some exclusivity with it. Yeah, maybe they end up kind of being a gatekeeper for other sorts of experiences and activations. Like right. I think about the the F1 event in Las Vegas this past year when Joshua Vidas as an artist, for example, I think this was a signal that we tracked, but he did, got to do some stuff with the Ferrari team and he created custom their custom driver uniforms and he painted the actual race cars for the race itself and they put out a series of products. Mm -hmm. So maybe now instead of that just being a collaboration direct with, from an artist to a F1 team, maybe it'll be like an artist through one of these fashion brands with the F1 team mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, I would assume that like teams could still get their own partnerships and sponsorships though because this is F1 like – is, it, is F1 kind of like the league? Like, it'd be yeah. like, right. It'd be like the NFL. NFL or, right. Yeah. So I just would be shocked if there's, like, F1, I almost said players, drivers couldn't get their own partnerships. Yeah, for sure. Like, Lewis Hamilton doesn't want to be limited by whatever F1's licensing deal is and right. what he wears to his races by any means. Right. Speaking of Lewis Hamilton, um, Obviously, we many of us, if not all of us, know about Drive to Survive, the show on Netflix that's kind mm -hmm. of catapulted F1 into more like mass appeal. Um, but there's also a movie in the works called Apex that's being produced by Apple in partnership with Lewis Hamilton, and it's going to be starring Brad Pitt. So there's just more and more happening in this kind of like F1 atmosphere that's bringing it um, and increasing and kind of like accelerating its popularity. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, as I was researching this, are speculating that it's going to be part of the big three or four of like global sports brands, which right now I think most would agree it's football, basketball, and tennis. Um, tennis. Yeah, tennis is up there. It's huge in the fashion space. It's mm -hmm. almost more like maybe a little bit more exclusive than basketball and football. Um, but they're all so saturated with fashion partnerships already. So F1 is kind of the unharvested crop, for mm -hmm. lack of better words, where there's more opportunity and less competition so far. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that they're going after this now. But yeah. um, it's interesting to note that F1 specifically, beyond just having more mass appeal, their Gen Z audience has really boomed. Interesting. Yeah. So... I think every fashion house is wanting Gen Z's attention right now. Yeah, of course. They're like the up and coming generation. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember watching Drive to Survive and I was like really, it was such a good show, but it didn't turn me into a fan, which was like shocking because it didn't like I haven't really paid attention to anything related to F1 for a while. I mean, it was a, it was a really good show and I was like, oh, this is really cool. And it obviously made me more respectful of the right. sport. But I wasn't like it was it didn't do the same thing to me like hard knocks did. Right. Okay. Well if I had to pick between football or F one for you, I'd prefer you be excited about football. Yeah. It might be because there were no wags in it. Maybe. Although the thing I do like that I've noticed about F one compared to like football and basketball, for example, is just the level of like villain story that exists in it. Like I think mm. you kind of have your role players in the NBA and the NFL that some are like the likable ones and mm -hmm. some are the family ones and mm -hmm. some are the, so they kind of have a villain kind of attitude or, or persona about them, but they don't lean into it as heavy. Mm -hmm. But I think in the F1 space or in the F1 world, there's, definitely like heroes and villains yeah and for a while it kind of seemed like lewis hamilton had a bit of the villain edge but in but then max verstappen came onto the scene and just his whole personality he doesn't care about anything he'd do anything to win and he wins most of the time mm -hmm. i feel like is like one of the bigger villains in sports right now mm -hmm. and obviously every f1 racer and team wants to win every event but i think almost as much as they want to win they want Max to lose. Yeah. You know? I, and I don't think you see that as much in other sports. Other sports, at least not right now. No, I love sports athlete villains. Yeah. Like I think it's so cool. That it reminds me of that Nike campaign where it was like, Am I bad? And it was 
oh my gosh, I still sometimes just like go and find it and watch that ad. It's so good. It's like the the OG Nike voice, which I think was um Willem Dafoe. Mm. Or he's like a he's Couldn't also like a a villain, like a movie villain, where he plays a lot in villains. But it was like, am I bad because, you know, I win win? Mm-hmm. Like, am I bad? And I just love like I I I love when people are like so good that it makes you want to see them lose. Patrick Mahomes. Right. Yeah. Michael Jordan. LeBron James. But I think more than any of those sports, it's like that right now in F1. Mm -hmm. And I think what goes really well with a hero and a villain is fashion. Like you think about like movies like James Bond and Mission Impossible. There's always like, it's set in like Europe and they're wearing suits and, mm-hmm. and designer and like things right. like that. And it's all these like really high end, high net worth kind of mm-hmm. moments. And that's, that seems like the reality coming from a F1 and LVMH partnership. Yeah. Have you seen like the trend on TikTok when people are like, oh, I'm entering my villain era? I feel like I've heard that term but I don't think I've necessarily seen it on TikTok yeah as much as I love that like I wish I could embody that that's so not me (laughs) no (laughs) you're not a villain I'm way too nice I wish I was villain I gave villain vibes why be the hero kind of cool you're my hero that's nice but I want to be your villain you do (laughs) I'll talk to you about that later (laughs) you're just (laughs) pumped Friday night (laughs) you can be my villain no no um Yeah, I like a good villain story and the vibes that come with it. Who do you think is the most iconic villain? Whoa. Do you have one in mind? The first thing that came to mind is Ursula from Little Mermaid. Wow, the first thing that came to mind. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure there's better. I mean, like the Joker. Yes. So misunderstood. Joker's iconic. That is a really good villain. Yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of spinning my tires. It's hard to choose. Well, what villains are you thinking about? Well, yeah, I think my brain first went to Batman because I've always loved Batman. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Batman, too, now that you bring up the Joker, is there's always kind of that question in your mind with Batman is like, is he actually a hero or is he a villain? Yeah, that's what I, that's the thing. Like, it really depends on your perspective. Yeah. Anyone can be a hero and anyone can be a villain. Yeah. Like, I'm sure to the so villain, the hero have is the villain. You potential to be a villain. Yeah, so you maybe. You come off as a hero right now, but. If you look deeper, I could be the villain. I will look deeper. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yeah, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to explore this further. <laughs> Well, that's all we have for today. Mm-hmm. So make sure that you subscribe on YouTube and follow along on Instagram, catch our clips, leave us a comment. Most of all, I think out of this week, we need help picking our next show to watch. So it's if true. you have any ideas, we don't like things that are overly disturbing. We don't want to be scared or stressed. We love rom-coms, but also a little bit of fantasy or sci-fi here and there. Um, you love a documentary. I'm not I need to be in a certain mood for a doc, especially a docu-series, because that's a serious commitment. But, yeah, if you got anything good, especially something that's funny, drop it in a comment on YouTube or Instagram, Mm -hmm. and uh, we'll let you know if we watch it. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Oh, I almost forgot. Oh, goodness. Oh, no, it's backwards. (sighs) It's not too loud. Thanks for listening. Salutations. (laughs) We need to get that branded if we're going to keep it around.